well. Welcome to today's video. Today we are doing a true crime video and it's been long awaited, highly requested, and I'm finally bringing you a new case. I just for the heck of it yesterday decided to look up lesser known true crime cases. That was exactly what I typed into Google. This was the first one I found and I literally audibly said what when I read it and so I knew that I wanted to share it with you. So we are going back into the 1960s for this case and we are talking about a girl named Terry Jo Duperalt. For fear that I'm probably saying her name wrong, we're just going to refer to her as Terry Jo in this video. Um, Terry Jo is alive. She is still alive, but she went through a very traumatic and very dangerous occurrence in her life that pretty much no other 11-year-old could probably say that they went through. And it's just a, such a wild, bizarre story. There are still so many unanswered questions that unfortunately I don't think anybody will ever get the answers to, but let's get into it. So, in 1961, Terry Jo was 11 years old, and she was found drifting alone on an inflatable boat in the middle of the ocean, where she was drifting alone for 84 hours and was found by a freight ship. So, let's backtrack with just a little bit of a backstory. So, in 1961, she was discovered. She was alive, but she was alone and she was in rough shape. There is a very famous photo taken on the day that she was found, which we will get into a little bit later. But we'll get into how she ended up in that situation in a little bit. But we're going to talk about um, like how she was found first, and then we're going to backtrack. It'll make sense. So she was drifting for 84 hours in the middle of the ocean, 11 years old. And Captain Theo, he was a second officer on the freight ship that found her. Captain Theo spotted her. And he was looking out. It was his job to scout the ocean to look, you know, look in the direction that they were headed. He was looking over the Northwest Providence Channel, which uh, is a strait that divides two, the two main islands of the Bahamas. And there were hundreds and hundreds of boats in this channel. So among these boats, he's looking out and he sees a white little speck in the water amongst all the boats and he knew that it was it was too big to be a piece of debris but it was too small to be a boat that far out into the ocean so he alerted his main captain and they turned the ship so that they could head towards that white speck and thank god they did because when they pulled up they found an 11-year-old blonde little girl floating in this lifeboat. And it was so small, it was like an inflatable one. Very tiny. And the captains actually recounted that when they were looking down at her, they saw like a family of sharks circling under her. So they were yelling at her to just stay in the boat until they could get close enough to get her. They didn't want her to jump out or anything. So, it was in that moment before they got her out of the lifeboat that one, someone on their crew took that famous photo and it's the moment that the little girl looks up and realizes that they are going to save her. Um, it made the front page of Life magazine and it was, it was shared around the world at the time, so it was a very famous thing. A lot of people knew that it had happened. I personally have never heard of this before, but maybe some of you that are older than me, maybe you remember when this happened or have heard of it. So again, she was alive, but she was incoherent. She was in and out of it, barely able to speak. They gave her water, they gave her orange juice, and because 
because she was so dehydrated. She had no food, no water, and had nothing covering her from the grueling sun in the middle of the ocean for 84 hours. So she was so dehydrated, so they were trying to wash her with, you know, washcloths, trying to get all the salt off of her skin, tried to coat her lips in Vaseline. Um, but she was in, in real, real rough shape, and she was taken to the hospital for recovery, and again, we'll get into a little bit more of the details of her rescue in a little bit, but I just wanted to give you the main event, just so I could paint a picture in your mind of what happened. So, the story of how she got into the middle of the ocean. So, it was November of 1961. Her father, who was a, a, a successful optometrist in Wisconsin, that's where they lived, he had, he chartered a luxury yacht, it was called bluebell so this case is more known um by like searching the bluebell rather than her name but you would find it either way um but that was the luxury yacht that they were on and they took it from florida fort lauderdale to the bahamas and it was supposed to be a family family trip family vacation they had saved up a long time for it finally had the means to do it and took the family on a trip so on board was, I didn't write his name down, the dad, his wife Jean, and there are three kids. There was Brian, who was 14, and Terry Jo, who was 11, and Renee, who was 7. The dad also brought along a friend of his whose name was Julian Harvey. He was a former Marine and a World War II veteran. And they brought him, I think, one, because they were friends, but also two. He was what was his title? I didn't write it down, just like to help on board. I don't know boating terminology, but he was going to help on board and, and, you know, drive the thing and do all the things. Julian also brought his wife, whose name was Mary Dean. So, how many is that? Three, four, five, six, seven of them on the luxury boat. The first five days of vac vacation went on without a hitch. Everybody was getting along, everybody had fun, there were no problems. On the fifth night, Terry Jo was in bed. She was in her cabin, but everybody else pretty much was still awake. And she heard screaming and really loud, like, foot stomping above her cabin, which was the main, the, the main deck. And she recalled hearing her brother like screaming for their dad and screaming for help. So later, much later after her rescue and she was okay enough to recount what happened, she recalled that she went upstairs to investigate what the sound was and she saw her mother and her brother lying on the floor and she said there was blood everywhere so it is presumed that they were already dead. She then saw Julian, the friend, the father's friend, she saw Julian, and he started walking towards her, and she asked what had happened, and he just slapped her across the face, and then told her to go back inside and go back to her, to her cabin. So she did. Shortly after, she noticed the water levels began to rise, like, in her cabin, so the yacht was sinking. So she went back up to where Julian was. She ran to him and she asked if the yacht was indeed sinking, to which he replied, yes. He then asked her something along the lines of, is the dinghy on the side of the yacht, like, is it there? Is it there? Is it ready to go? And she said yes. So then he jumped into said dinghy and left. Later, and I'll give more details on this, but later, if you're wondering, he did have his dead wife with him, who I'm pretty sure he dumped. And he had the seven-year-old who had also passed away. The father, Terry Joe's father, was also dead. So now Terry Joe is alone in this yacht. Blood everywhere. She's 11 years old. The yacht's sinking. And it's still not really clear why he left her and didn't just 
just kill her. But um, she was alone on the yacht. And she remembered that there was one single raft boat on the other side of the boat. So a little smaller than a dinghy. It was just, it was one of those lifeboats that you, you know, you pop it and it inflates. So she was a smart girl. She went, she took it, she put it in the water, and she got on the boat. And that is where she spent 84 hours with no food, no water, nothing to cover her, just like the little dress or pajamas that she was wearing. And that was it, in the middle of the ocean. So after she was found and rescued, it took four whole days for her to kind of come to and be strong enough to recount what happened to her. When she woke up in the hospital, though, she had no idea still what Julian had done. She didn't know that he he had drowned his wife and also stabbed the rest of her family. So, you know, people, of course, trying to figure out what happened, right? But Terry Joe was asleep and everybody else, unfortunately, had passed away. So it's hard to know what really happened and what motivated him, but it is assumed that Julian killed his wife to collect a $20,000 double insurance policy on her. He, I read that he was going through tough times because he was, he was a veteran and was uh, trouble finding work, I believe, and just he was just going through it. So it is believed that he did that, took her life to get that money. And then further, it was hypothesized that Terry Joe's dad had probably witnessed him killing his wife. I said that he that she drowned. She didn't drown. That's incorrect. But he did kill her. It's hypothesized that Terry Joe's dad caught him in the act, maybe even his wife too. And so Julian felt like he had to get rid of everybody in order to get away with it, essentially. Um, so then, yeah, me when he sunk the yacht and escaped on the dinghy, he was found by another freight um, ship. And this one was called the Gulf Lion. And he was brought to a U.S. Coast Guard site on November 13th, so of course, he's questioned, where did you come from, what happened, what happened to the people you were with, blah, 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 blah. So he told the Coast Guard that the yacht had started to go down when they were hit with a squall. If you don't know what a squall is, it's basically, and I only know this from working in news, a squall comes in, It's a. it can be a snowstorm, a rainstorm, and it'll come in, it's just like a wave, and it'll only last for a few minutes, and then it'll be like nothing happened. Like the, you know, it's just, it's quick one too, it's here and it's gone. So he said that the yacht was hit by a squall, and that's what caused the yacht to like break down and, you know, whatever, and then go down. He did have Renee, the seven-year-old, he had her body with him on his dinghy, and he said that he found her floating after he had gotten in the dinghy and he said he kept her body with him out of respect. We can guess that that's probably not true. It's now believed that he thought that that would maybe help his story by keeping her with him. Um, he said he tried to revive her, but it didn't work. And then he got separated from everybody else and blah, blah, blah. Um, an autopsy later did prove that the child died by drowning, um, but how, we don't really know. So, Terry Joe had been discovered three days after him. So he was November 13th, she was November 16th that she was found. And, um, they told him what happened, because he, so the Coast Guard kept him for questioning and while they may not have thought it was the most believable story or they still had questions or they were confused there was no proof that he did anything wrong so they had to you know let him go but when they did tell him that terry joe was found you know they thought he would be happy like oh somebody else on your yacht survived you're not the sole survivor you know he 
um, they said his response was to exclaim, oh my god, before quickly and calmly adding, isn't that wonderful? So that was his oh crap moment, because Terry Joe was very much awake, was very much alive, and saw his behavior and saw what he did. So he was probably having a lot of regrets for letting her live, but thank god he did. So the next day, he checked into a motel and took his life. Um, this next sentence might be triggering for you, so if you don't want to know how he took his own life, then skip a little bit. I don't know how much I should say because I don't want YouTube to get mad at me, but um, basically he had a double-edged razor and a uh, thigh ankle and throat. I hope you skipped that if that is not for you. Um, he also left a two-page note that was lying next to his body. The note left no explanations or apologies for anything, but it ended with the words, I got too tired and nervous. I couldn't stand it any longer. So that kind of sounds like he had a lot of fear that he was going to get caught and, you know, he was scared that Terry Joe was going to tell people what had happened and what she saw and he chose that to be his out. So, like I said before, no one knows why he let Terry Joe live. I don't, we don't know if maybe that was his favorite of the kids or if he had a moment of feeling any sense of morality and having morals and just let her go. Terry Joe now, like I said, is alive. Um, she said that he probably just thought that I was gonna die anyway and just wanted to escape quicker and just left her to sink with the boat. Um, following the loss of her family, if you're curious, Terry Joe did go live with her grandmother and her father's sister and her three cousins in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Um, she is still very much alive for a while after this all happened. She didn't want to talk about it. She didn't talk about it really at all. Um, she didn't want to feel like a victim. She didn't want to deal with it like that whole thing. Um, but as she got older, I think she did a television interview and I know there were articles written about it and stuff. So as she got older, she finally felt like she was in a place where she was comfortable talking about it. Um, I cannot imagine living through something like that. That is so wild. That has to almost feel like not real to her. But at the same time, she lost her whole family. Um, so, you know, it, it's gotta feel real, but I can't even imagine. So I know this was a little bit of a shorter case, um, but I hope that you find it interesting. Definitely, if you're interested in learning more about it, I recommend you looking it up. Um, but that is the case I have for you today. <laughs>